Part Thirteen of Collected Prose by James Elroy Flecker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Four of the Grecians: Technical Training. The three friends were at Pistoia. They had arrived a little after noon, and had spent an hour or two already in observation, and were entranced that this little town should be a treasure mine of beauty, and contain more fair and noble creations than three English counties. For in it are many large churches of white marble striped with black, fascinating the curious. And there is a pleasant Duomo and a noble baptistry and a superb pulpit by him of Pisa, who first learned from unearthed Greek marbles that even stone men may move and be divine, and very old curious reliefs by Gruomons and Adodat, who did not know this. And, above all, there is the finest work of the Della Robbias, that frieze on the Ospedale, where in bright-coloured relief are sweetly represented the seven works of mercy. Thus it was, that, possessed by that peace and largesse of the spirit that comes to those who have lovingly contemplated works of beauty and structures of delight, they sat down in the evening at a little café in a side street, and, just as the last rays of sunset were leaning across the plain to kiss the Apennines, earnestly reopened their discussion. As far as I can remember what you said at Bologna, we must now deal with technical training, that is, with instruction given in order to enable our boys to earn their livings. It seems we must either give a few general ideas, or enter into a mass of detail and suggest what is necessary for each profession or trade. Trade? I presumed we were reforming the ordinary English public school. Are we going to reform board school education as well? We cannot talk about a select school when we are considering ideals of education. But we cannot, under any conceivable circumstances, educate together our diplomats and our shoe-blacks. Which would be injured most if we did, I wonder, our diplomats or our shoe-blacks? Oh, it would only vulgarise our diplomats and make our shoe-blacks discontented. Then you consider that discontent in a shoe-black is not divine, and that the quality of a gentleman is skin-deep? Never mind, Edwinson. You believe in aristocracy, and so do I. You hate vulgarity of manners. I dislike it also, but not as much as I dislike vulgarity of mind. If I do not hold your belief in the British aristocracy of today, it is because I find that most of them, except those few who are actively engaged in state service, are both vacuous and vulgar. You may know them better than I do, but as far as I can judge, their views on art and life are as vulgar as their taste in amusement and their attitudes in motor-cars. Our philosophers and artists find little of the encouragement from them which they would have infallibly obtained two hundred years ago. They have been forced to take sides with democracy. Some day, perhaps, our men of sense and wisdom will form a party to themselves, and wrest the reins of government from demagogues and quacks. But you know well enough that our best and most venerable public schools contain numbers of boys whose grandfathers were, shall we say, shoe-blacks, and that some of those boys are tolerable and some the reverse, because some have minds and some have not. It is education that refines and mental quiescence that degrades. We will have no deformed natures in our school, but we will teach all who are capable of receiving instruction how to talk pleasant English and to behave prettily. Phonetics will help us, and any poor boy of mean birth who shows himself worthy of the higher education shall receive it. We will make a scheme to help them out of the school funds, partly by giving scholarships, partly by lending them money to be repaid when they are in secure positions, earning a fair income. If a duke's son, on the other hand, shows himself incapable of learning manners, he shall either learn the trade for which he is fitted, or leave us. I am afraid the dukes will not send their sons to us. Then we will hope to have the sons of North Country artisans. The class has begun to think independently and to delight in reading, 
and they are the best class of men in england but to return to our technical training not only is it impossible to talk about separate trade details but also impossible to build the small town which we would require if we were going to teach a number of trades a boy will have to leave school early if he wants to specialise in bookbinding or horse training so we will talk first of all those things which will be useful to all boys throughout life and beginning at the beginning we must consider reading and writing we must teach them spelling rationally and by derivation but if they know no latin a boy can learn that medius means middle without spending years at cicero and horace you can tell a boy that the word we pronounce fuchsia is connected with the german for a fox even if he hasn't read and could not read the second part of faust and i don't much mind about spelling when all is said and done it is a matter of a special faculty of observation and a man may be a splendid engineer and write parallel with an l too few the boys ought to read beautifully is a fact so obvious that it has been universally forgotten our young men are a tribe of mumblers but it is about writing that i have very definite suggestions to make i am convinced of the futility of copy-books double-lined paper and all other aids to calligraphy i am persuaded that it is absurd to worry about the writing of a child of ten i am also persuaded that it is very important to worry about the writing of a boy of fifteen to teach beauty of writing is perhaps impossible the beauty of a writing lies in its character and nothing is more revolting than a copperplate fist but we can teach legibility and even speed then we should consider arithmetic but hoffman you know more about that than i do i think i can point out to you a serious mistake which modern educationalists make they want little boys to be so intelligent they yearn to show them the reason of things they would like them to work out for themselves the theory of subtraction and they revel in a horribly complicated system of shortened division it is so much easier for a small boy to learn things by rule let the problems of numbers come when he has learnt his tables and can add up money and has mastered the fair twin systems of fractions yes hoffman and do you think we need worry them with any but the most important of our horrible weights and measures might we not keep hidden from them the mysteries of pecks scruples and bushels till they come actually to need them and abolish discount sums stock and share sums compound interest sums till the days when they have more than fourpence a week to spend on speculation shall we not tire of papering rectangular rooms with square windows but since we are going to have workshops they will be able to take a practical interest in many of these things the measuring of the wood and the calculation of its price will not in our school be left to the carpenter and the misfits of home-made cupboard doors and will give them sound lessons in practical geometry we have now mentioned reading writing and arithmetic will our hopelessly stupid people our bricklayers and boot-blacks need anything more in the ideal state as i conceive it they would not the government would ensure that these limited individuals should live in comfort and cleanliness and be paid in proportion to the simplicity of their occupations in an ideal country if any of them in after years found his intellect developing and began to read books in our free libraries he could at any time take the state examination and by passing it become entitled to a more profitable and less humdrum occupation if schools like ours were established all over this ideal england and if you were to give all boys a real chance unskilled labour would become very dear then we shall have to invent more machines to take the place of unskilled labour my dear hoffman but we do not live in an ideal england but in a country where the stupidest boys may be the heirs to fortunes for all we know and where they will all certainly be entitled to votes let us then consider what might be done under existing circumstances i think our plan will be this we will wait till the boys are fifteen years old and then we will take those who are deriving no benefit from their more advanced classes which they attend and put them in a class together where we must endeavour to teach them if we can the elementary rules of argument and even show them that they need not believe a thing because it is printed and published 
we shall perhaps be able to do this by means of examples of vicious argument and petitiones principii culled from the daily papers also they ought to know a little of the inner working of political events during the last twenty years and we will read to them the best stories of english history to make them proud of their country also if we are cynical we will teach them the doctrines of carlyle to make them proud of their work and if a plato arises to turn political economy into something at once simple and profound we will teach them that we shall fail perhaps to make any impression on these unfortunates but we shall not have been guilty of neglect but the difficulty is that we cannot really divide our school up into sheep and goats or wise and foolish even by examination we are going to have in our school boys of a hundred different grades of intelligence a hundred different aptitudes and we shall have to grade our instruction accordingly our guardians our brilliant boys our philakis will learn everything they can but obviously our doctors will have more of the instruction we give to our philakis than our bakers or butchers all that is a mere matter of detail ah had you ever been a schoolmaster smith you would not prattle so merrily about matters of detail we have not yet said a word about the higher education but look at the mess in which we are already involved boys who are going to be boot blacks will be attending the bottom class in political economy boys in the top class of political economy will be attending the lowest class in boot blacking it seems your rule is simply this that we are going to teach everybody everything they can learn not such a bad ideal either hoffman but the picture you draw is perverse and unjust however i think it would be better to put a little order into the apparent chaos in this way we are going to draw a sharp dividing line in our table of school hours the morning will be spent entirely in teaching boys things that will help them to earn their money the morning will be devoted to workshops bookkeeping shorthand all work of any sort that is done with the object of passing examinations not excluding that specialised training in writing greek and latin poetry which enables a man to gain scholarships and earn his living as a don of course it will be hard to arrange for boys may be going to earn money in a thousand different ways but we have pointed out that very few of the more specialised sorts of technical training can be given in school it comes to little more than saying that the ordinary school work done on the scientific or modern side of an up-to-date school day will be compressed into the morning with the huge advantage that we are neither going to worry our scientists with greek irregular verbs nor our architects with chemistry from the moment when the boy or his parents or we ourselves judging from the boy's preferences and character have decided what profession he is to follow before the age of fifteen by which time he ought to have made up his mind a boy will be given his chance of working at various studies and occupations to test his capacity or preference the afternoon we shall employ in real education but florence is the place where we will talk of that nor could i imagine a better scene for so high a discussion it is a pity we cannot connect pistoia too with our technical training since florence will be so suitable and we connected bologna with the inaugural discussion and the mountain heights with physical accomplishments well pistoia used to be a great manufacturing town in the old days it was the birthplace of pistols hence its name see baedeker end of chapter four end of part thirteen